Excited Utterance, the Evidence and Proof Podcast. Episode 77, Christian Dahlman, Naked Statistical Evidence and Incentives for Lawful Conduct. Welcome to Excited Utterance. I'm your guest host, Alex Nunn, from the University of Arkansas School of Law. Excited Utterance is your podcast for cutting-edge scholarship and developments in the world of evidence. We bring virtual workshops to you throughout the academic year. Our guest today is Christian Dahlman from Lund University in Sweden. Christian's paper, entitled Naked Statistical Evidence and Incentives for Lawful Conduct, takes our conversation on the podcast back to a familiar place. We're going to be discussing the proof paradoxes and their broader implications. Is it permissible to convict someone solely on the basis of probabilities? What if, eventually, we're sure that the use of bare probabilities would see an innocent man or woman convicted? Christian's project attacks these questions and provides yet another truly meaningful contribution to the literature. As you'll hear today, Christian's project is both taxonomical and substantive. Sifting through the growing literature, Christian's project first sorts the existing responses to the proof paradoxes into two primary categories, seeing solutions that grapple with the paradoxes through epistemology and others that see the paradoxes as giving rise to a moral problem. Falling into that latter camp, Christian will then introduce his views on the proof paradoxes, calling on a Benthamite view on the legal justification of verdicts. Finally, our podcast today concludes in quite a fun way, by tying lines of conversation together. You'll hear Christian's thoughts and his disagreements with Mike Pardo's views on the proof paradoxes, which you'll of course remember from our episode with Mike this past spring. Christian, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alex. Great to be on the show. I'm a fan of your show, and I'm very happy to be part of it. Well, we are thrilled to have you on. Your paper begins by noting that the problem of naked statistical evidence is really one of the most debated issues in evidence theory. And as many of our listeners likely know, uh, this debate usually runs through motivating hypotheticals, like Charles Nesson's famous prison riot case. So let's tee up the issue of naked statistical evidence today with Nesson's hypothetical. Christian, what does it involve? So, first of all, I mean, as you say, it's not a real case, it's an imagined case, and also in the literature there are various versions of it. But, okay, let's go with the version that I'm using in my paper. So imagine we have a prison where there's a riot, and there are 100 prison inmates participating in that riot. And at a certain point in the riot, some prisoners start attacking a guard, and they actually kill the guard. And we know for sure that 99 of the 100 prisoners who participated in the riot participate in the killing of the guard. There's only one guy who goes over to the other side of the prison yard and doesn't participate. So let us then imagine that all these 100 prisoners participating in the riot escape, and one of them is caught the next day and is prosecuted for participating in the killing of the guard. And he then claims that he didn't participate. He claims that he was actually the only guy who didn't participate, the hundred guy who was at the other side of the prison yard. In this imagined example, it's assumed that we know absolutely for sure that there were 100 people, 100 prisoners participating in the riot. We know for sure that 99 participated in the killing of the guard. We know for sure that one didn't participate. And there is no other evidence whatsoever. There, is, there are no witnesses, no trace evidence, shoe prints, DNA, or anything else. There is just this naked statistic that we know that 99 out of 100 participated in the killing. The question is now, would it be legally right to convict the defendant on this evidence alone? Most lawyers have the intuition that it wouldn't be legally right, and it wouldn't be morally right either. The question is then, well, how can that be so? Because the probability that he is one of the participants is 99%. So isn't that sufficient to convict? 
Even if we wouldn't think that 99% is sufficient, we could even change the example to say that there were a thousand prisoners and only one didn't participate. So it's 99.9% or, or so forth. So what the conclusion seems to be here is that even if the probability is very high, it's not all right to convict. How is that so? What's the problem here? There, people seem to agree that there is some kind of of problem, but what is the problem exactly? And that has spawned this literature that you're referring to, where people have produced lots of different solutions to the so-called problem of naked statistical evidence. What is missing here exactly? So what's our intuition about? And let's dive deeper into that literature that you mentioned, because you note in your paper that hypotheticals like the prison riot case have effectively hidden some, let's call it, definitional ambiguity surrounding the term naked statistical evidence. So let's break that term down. What do you see as the unique characteristics of naked statistical evidence? That's a very good question. The interesting thing, as you say, is that normally this literature doesn't start by defining really what naked statistical evidence is, but it usually starts by presenting an example and taking the argument from there. It's also the, the case that people sometimes talk about this as not naked statistic, but just statistical evidence. But to me, that seems to be a problem. I prefer to call it naked statistical evidence because since people agree that it would have been okay to convict the guy if there had been trace evidence, if there had been a shoe print or DNA or something, wouldn't that have been, in a sense, also using statistics? Yes, it would have been, because what a forensic shoe print scientist does is that he or she looks at the shoe print and sees some kind of wear or something on the shoe print that matches the suspect's shoe, and then says, okay, so th this is a reason for believing that this is the source of the shoe print. If we want to make an assessment of how strongly that supports that hypothesis, that depends on the probability of a random match. If this specific wear is very unusual, if the sole pattern that matches very unusual, this kind of wear on the heel, if, it's, if there are many shoes that demonstrate the same properties or if it's very unusual, etc., and the more unusual the match is, the stronger it supports the evidence that the shoe print actually comes from this shoe. And that is also using statistics, the statistics on the frequencies of sole patterns or the frequencies of certain wear marks or, or whatever. So the problem with naked statistical evidence isn't that it's simply that it uses statistics. It's something more. Therefore, the term naked statistic. To me, it seems that the fundamental difference between trace evidence such as a shoe print, and naked statistical evidence has to do with the direction of causality between the hypothesis and the evidence. Because if you look at a trace evidence, the direction of causality goes from the hypothesis to the evidence. In this case, the hypothesis would be that the suspect shoe made the shoe print and the evidence is the observed shoe print. The hypothesis is that he participated in the killing of the guard and therefore made the shoe print. So the direction of causality goes from hypothesis to evidence. It is because he participated in the killing of the guard that his shoe print is there. Whereas naked statistical evidence is different because the direction of causality, if there is any, seems to go in the other direction. It goes from evidence to, to hypothesis. If we look at the naked statistical evidence in the prison riot case, it's the fact that the suspect participated in the riot. And the hypothesis is that he participated in the killing of the guard. And since participating in the riot occurred previously in time, it's not possible that causality can run from the hypothesis to the evidence. It's not that he participating in the killing that might have caused him to participate in the riot. That's not possible. What is possible is the other way around, that because he participated in the riot, that caused him, gave him the opportunity, motivation, and so forth 
to participate in the killing. So the direction of causality goes the other way. And this, to me, seems to be the fundamental difference between trace evidence and naked statistical evidence. And the question is, is therefore, what is it with this direction of causality that makes it problematic to convict on naked statistical evidence although it would be perfectly fine to convict with the same degree of probability on trace evidence. Great. And now with your working framework for naked statistical evidence in hand, let's turn briefly to your paper's examination of other approaches to this type of probabilistic evidence. So you note that the literature here can really be divided into two general subcategories. So Christian, what are those categories? Basically, well, as we said here, there are lots of different solutions to this problem. This, that, I think that's fascinating in itself that this debate has been going on for 50 years or something, and there are a number of different solutions that have been proposed to what exactly is the root of the problem. If you look at these different solutions, they can, as you say, be divided up into camps. What I would call, on the one hand, the epistemic solutions, solutions having to do with knowledge, and on the other hand, moral solutions. All the epistemic solutions, what they have in common is the idea that there is something wrong with naked statistical evidence with regard to the knowledge that we obtain where we have statistical evidence, uh, naked statistical evidence. Somehow our beliefs based on naked statistical evidence doesn't count as knowledge in the same way that our beliefs based on uh, trace evidence do according to this approach. So that this would be the epistemic approach. It's not simply a probability of 99% versus probability of 99%, but it's somehow the wrong kind of knowledge produced by naked statistical evidence. The moral approach, on the other hand, would say that, no, 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 there is, there is nothing wrong here with probabilities or knowledge. The, the, the problem lies elsewhere. The problem has to do with the underlying moral justification for the legal verdict. So according to the moral approach, you would say that, well, wait a minute, what we're dealing with here is that someone is actually being convicted of a crime, and there is an underlying moral theory that justifies criminal law about when it is okay for us to convict someone, send someone to prison. What happens in these cases with naked statistical evidence is that there's something wrong with this more underlying moral justification. The naked statistical evidence doesn't satisfy the requirements of that moral justification. So that's what's the problem here, something specifically legal having to do with the underlying morality of criminal law. Personally, I have a different view. I'm not a Kantian. I adhere to a Benthamite view on the underlying justification for criminal verdicts. And as you probably know, uh, Jeremy Bentham's idea was that it's only justified to convict someone if that has a forward-looking positive influence on the world, that it creates incentives to lawful behavior that outweighs the uh, harm done by the punishment. And that is my argument, my solution to the problem of naked statistical evidence that it has to do with incentives. The root of the problem, in my view, is that verdicts based on naked statistical evidence do not contribute in a positive way to the incentive structure for lawful behavior. So, Christian, let's build out that novel approach that you just mentioned. Describe to our listeners the so-called incentive solution to the problem of naked statistical evidence. I wouldn't say that it's a novel approach. It's not something that I was the first to argue. Richard Posner hinted this approach a long time ago, and other people have written about it. Chris Sankirico has made a very similar argument on character evidence. Enoch Spector and Fisher have this article, uh, have this this argument in an article of, of theirs. So, but I see more myself as someone who is kind of contributing, fleshing out this idea. And I think if one wants to understand what the incentive solution is about, the best thing is you should imagine yourself in a situation where you are a participator in a prison riot. 
So suppose you're there and suddenly some other guys start attacking a guard. Since you are a prisoner who has spent a lot of time reading up on legal cases during your confinement, you are well aware that there is this case, previous case, where someone was convicted during a, a prison riot for participating in the killing of the guard. And suppose that case was a naked statistical evidence case. The previous case was a case where the only evidence was that the guy was one of 100 prisoners participating in a riot and 99 of those participated in the killing of the guard. Now you're in a new situation where, let's say, there are 200 prisoners in your riot and when the assault on the guard starts, you see that there is one guy who doesn't participate. He is going over to the other side of the prison yard and the other 198 are all participating in the killing of the guard and you're asking yourself, okay, what should I do? Should I join the 198 who are killing the guard or should I join the lonely guy who isn't? Well, the question you must then ask yourself is, okay, so how will this affect the probability that if I'm later caught that I will be convicted for participating in the killing of the guard based on naked statistical evidence, just as the previous case. Well, you can do your math and say, okay, so if I don't participate and join the single guy, the situation will be that there will be 198 who participate in the killing. That's 99% probability against me. So I will be convicted, even if I was actually not participating. With the other option, if I decide to join the attackers, then there are 199 people attacking the guard and only one who isn't. So then there is a 99.5 probability against me in a future case. So it doesn't really matter what I do. And there's a 99% probability or a 99.5 probability that I did participate, whether I participate or not, and both are sufficient to convict me. So it doesn't matter what I do. In a future case, I will be convicted anyway. So I have no incentive whatsoever to refrain from participating and join the one guy who is standing alone because that won't help me. That's the argument here that previous case doesn't give me any incentives. And let's now compare this to trace evidence. Suppose instead that the old case is a case where someone was convicted based on trace evidence in a prison riot killing. So they found his DNA on the guard or they found his shoe print near where the guard was killed or something like that. What would be my reasoning in that situation if I again stand there deciding whether to join the 198 who are attacking the guard or the single guy who isn't? Well, in this situation, the old case gives me incentives to refrain because in that situation, I will, of course, say to myself, well, the risk that my DNA will be found on the guard if I participate is quite high. And if I refrain from participating, it's very unlikely that they will find my DNA on the guard. And the same thing with the shoe print. I cannot be absolutely sure. I mean, even if I participate, it might be that the forensic staff are competent and they don't find the DNA, so nothing is sure. But there will be a situation where it's much, much more probable that I will be convicted if I participate than if I refrain, and therefore the old case with the trace evidence gives me incentive to refrain uh, in order not to be convicted. So there is the very clear difference between these two situations. And Jeremy Bentham said in his theory about the, the moral justification of legal verdicts that the thing is this, said Bentham, that convicting someone is imposing harm on that person, suffering. And he even called it a mischief, that the state inflicts a mischief on the defendant when he's convicted because he's being punished. So that can only be morally justified, says Bentham as a utilitarian, if it is outweighed by some greater good. If this verdict somehow has a forward-looking effect that prevents greater mischief, 
And the idea is then, of course, that incentives do that. They uh, make people refrain from bad acts in the future and that the positive effects of, of that outweigh the harm created in the punishment. And so therefore, since this is the case with every single legal verdict, every criminal conviction, you must, according to Bentham, ask yourself the question in every single case, would this particular verdict, would punishing this guy somehow contribute through incentives in a positive way to society? Would it have a positive effect on the incentive structure that would outweigh the, the harm done by punishing that person. If it doesn't, the moral justification for punishment is gone. And that's the argument for what's wrong, according to me, with convictions based on naked statistical evidence, that that moral justification is missing. And that's why we shouldn't convict. So Christian, you just touched on this a little bit, but I want to press on it. So what do you anticipate as the pushback being against this incentive solution model? You note that it might be in tension with those who reject a Benthamite view on the justification of legal verdicts. What would your response be to those claims? Well, what I anticipate and what I know that some people who disagree with me would say is, of course, that they don't agree with this Benthamite view on the justifications of of criminal law. They have some different Kantian or some other view on on the matter. And what what they would say and what they do say is something along the following lines. No, that doesn't capture our intuition about what's morally wrong with convictions based on naked statistical evidence. Because they say that, well, our intuition tells us that it's not just that it's some kind of forward-looking incentive kind of thing that has to do with society in general in a utilitarian sense that's at stake here. But uh, what our intuitions tell us is that the defendant is somehow wronged by being convicted on uh, naked statistical evidence. So it's not that this forward-looking utilitarian thing, but it's some, some kind of backward-looking thing that has to do with the defendant and his previous actions and him being wronged now. That is the kind of argument that they're making. And my response to that is that I have a difficulty in understanding how exactly he is wronged if he's convicted on naked statistical evidence if you are taking this backward-looking moral philosophy concept. Because think about it. In what backward-looking way is, is the defendant wronged? Well, if you're the defendant and you're convicted on naked statistical evidence, there are two possibilities. One is that you're guilty. And in that situation, you can, uh, with this backward-looking argument, you could say, "Uh uh-huh, okay, well, even if I hadn't done it, uh, they would have convicted me anyway. So it it really didn't matter that I did it because the naked statistical evidence was there anyway. And, of course, this observation is completely true, but since the defendant is in fact guilty in that situation, it's hard for me to say that he is somehow being wrong because he's actually correctly being punished. He, he is guilty. So in order to claim that he is being wronged, you seem to be necessary to go with the other option, that he's innocent. So how would the backward-looking reflection of the defendant spell out in that situation? Well, in that case, the defendant would say the following. I've been convicted and I actually didn't do it. So I could just as well have participated in the killing. And that that wouldn't have made any difference for me because I'm convicted now and I would have been convicted then. So I feel kind of cheated here. So what's going on there? That's some kind of a, a reflection on a lost opportunity somehow. So convicting me on naked statistical evidence has created a situation where I have lost the opportunity of behaving illegally without any negative consequences because I'm convicted anyway. So if that's the argument, it's to me, that's very, it's very strange to say that the defendant is then wronged in somehow. 
because the lost opportunity here is a lost opportunity to behave illegally and immorally. Losing that opportunity is not being wronged as far as I can see. I want to bring your approach now into a conversation I had with Michael Pardo from Alabama on the podcast earlier this spring. Now, Michael insisted that solutions to the proof paradoxes thus far have largely been unsatisfying because they primarily focus on simply solving the paradoxes rather than grappling with the underlying deficiencies in our theoretical models of the proof process generally. Christian, do you see your incentive solution as reconceptualizing the entire proof process? No, absolutely not. And I see no reason to do that because I disagree fundamentally with Mike here. I don't think that there is any underlying deficiency in the probability approach to legal evidence. As you probably know, the naked statistical evidence debate has been very much provoked by the fact that people who are against the idea that probability approach to legal evidence, people like Mike Pardo and Ron Allen and others, have used these cases of naked statistical evidence and claim that they are paradoxes of proof, that, that they somehow show that there is something fundamentally wrong in thinking about legal proof in, in probability terms. And well, I belong to the other camp. I have a probability approach myself. I'm a Bayesian. And I think that my solution here shows that there is absolutely nothing wrong with the probability approach. As I said before, the problem here doesn't lie in probabilities. The problem has to do with the moral justification for convicting someone, the particularly underlying morality that in these rather strange situations with naked statistical evidence uh, is undermined. So I think that Mike must make the case that there is a actually a, a real problem with the probability approach, and he has failed to do so. So there is no underlying deficiency. So it sounds, Christian, like you're kind of flipping the script here, right? And you're asking why there even exists skepticism towards these probabilistic accounts, particularly because that skepticism perhaps is unfounded. So, so build out that countervailing view for us. Uh, absolutely. The way I see it, and also maybe a little different from a European point of view, is that if you look at various approaches, theories on theoretical approaches to legal evidence, to simplify things, you can divide up people into camps. You have one group of people, and I belong to those people who have a probability theory-based approach. They're almost all of them nowadays Bayesians. And their idea, our idea, is that legal fact finders should think about proof in, in Bayesian terms, and that would make for a better way of a more accurate and uh, way of handling legal proof. That would avoid a lot of fallacies, probabilistic fallacies that judges today and, and uh, other legal fact finders commit because they don't know enough probability theory. And then there are the other camp, people who are saying that we shouldn't use probability theory. That And in Europe, for example, we have a the so-called Dutch school of the, the so-called scenario approach, argued by Peter von Koppen and other people who have this idea that instead of teaching judges to math and probabilities, we should instead use a kind of intuistic, uh, holistic approach where we see proof as some kind of narrative. It's a story. So the prosecutor has one story and the defense has another story. And we should evaluate these two stories or scenarios against each other. In the vocabulary of Ron Allen and Mike Pardo, we should see which one is more plausible than the other in terms of so-called relative plausibility. And that, according to them, is something different than mathematical probabilities. So these are the two rival theories that are standing against each other. And what the people who are against the probability approach try to do is that they try to concoct these rather strange situations like the prison riot case, where they claim that in this situation, a probability approach would uh, lead to paradoxes. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, they have not been successful. They have 
none of these so-called paradoxes are actual paradoxes. They can be resolved and the problem lies elsewhere. It lies with the moral underpinnings of legal verdicts and not with probabilities. There is nothing wrong with thinking in terms of probability. On the contrary, it is the language that all other people who do science, except for lawyers, are trained to do as the way to handle decisions under uncertainty. And I think that the whole idea that lawyers are exempt to this, that law is some kind of a special domain where decisions under uncertainty are not governed by the thing that it's governed by everywhere else, is a rather strange idea. And I remember when you, I listened to your interview with Mike and you put this, Mike Pardo, you, you, you asked him, why is it that the probability approach is, sticks around, although you have demonstrated that it's inferior? The question I ask myself is the exact opposite question. Why does this inferior idea of relative plausibility and scenarios and the idea that law doesn't have to incorporate a Bayesian uh, or other probabilistic approach, why does that stick around so much, although it has no good arguments for it? My response to that would simply be, well, I think it's, even if you don't have any good arguments for it, it's an idea that sells easily to people because basically what you're telling these lawyers is instead of the thing that I'm telling judges when I speak to them on a daily basis here in Sweden, when I say to them, you have to learn math, you have to learn basic probability theory, otherwise you're going to make reasoning mistakes. What they're saying is the exact opposite. Oh, it's fine, you don't have to learn anything, you don't have to worry about math and all those stuff. You're doing fine. You're doing uh, perfectly well, doing as you've always done, and there is no problem. And, of course, that's a, a message that's easy to sell to people because it's always easier to tell someone that they don't need to make an effort than to tell them that they, that they need to make one. Last question, Christian. Is there a next step for this ever-growing literature? If there is, what type of paper would shed additional insight on these well-examined hypotheticals? Yeah, well, I mean, my view is that there isn't actually a problem here. There is no underlying deficiencies. Maybe we should focus on the real problems. But, of course, if one wants to go further with the incentive solution that I have proposed, then one could, of course, investigate further exactly how different kind of verdicts with different kinds of naked statistical evidence affect the incentive structure. Because in the example that I used, which is rather simple, the argument is simply that the convicting someone on naked statistical evidence doesn't produce any incentives whatsoever. So therefore, it doesn't have a positive influence on the incentive structure. But there are more interesting, more complicated cases where the effect is actually negative on the incentive structure. For example, the so-called blue bus case, which has been discussed a lot that we haven't mentioned here, and other situations that are a little more complicated and interesting that one could map out how actually verdicts based on naked statistical evidence can have a negative effect on people's incentive, could give people a reason to act unlawfully. Well, Christian, it has been great having you on the show. Thanks so much for coming on. It's been a great being a part of the show. Thanks for having me. For all the many times that I've talked about the proof paradoxes on the podcast, I haven't yet actually provided a picture of my own thoughts on the motivating hypotheticals. So I thought today I'd briefly provide some insight on how I think we should approach these puzzles and use my solution simply as a means to demonstrate why Christian's new project is such an important contribution to the literature. So my paper focuses on Jonathan Cohen's Gatecrasher's Paradox, which is essentially the civil counterpart to the prison riot problem discussed by Christian on the podcast today. Now, in the Gatecrasher's Paradox, we're asked to imagine that 1,000 individuals attend a rodeo. But of those 1,000 attendees, only 499 actually purchase a ticket. The 501 other attendees are trespassers or so-called gatecrashers. Now the question asked by the gatecrashers paradox, therefore, 
is whether the owner of the rodeo venue can simply rely on population statistics. The 50.1% chance that a randomly selected rodeo attendee failed to purchase a ticket to bring a suit for trespass against all 1,000 rodeo attendees. After all, when we're just relying on these population statistics, for each attendee, there's a greater than not chance that he or she failed to purchase a ticket, and therefore, the preponderance standard for each attendee is seemingly satisfied. So my solution, published in the Vanderbilt Law Review, I think back in 2015, suggests that the use of naked statistical evidence in the Gatecrasher's paradox, as well as the prison riot case, by the way, would give rise to a due process violation. How does that work? Well, courts in the United States have held that the use of, quote, inherently factually contradictory theories, prosecutorial theories, that is, violates the principles of due process. That is, a due process violation occurs when a prosecutor advances irreconcilable theories for a case against multiple defendants in an attempt to simultaneously secure mutually exclusive verdicts for a single, quote, lone gunman crime. Why? Well, the absolute certainty that the prosecutor has presented a false impression and attempted to convict an innocent person in at least one of these trials renders each trial fundamentally unfair. This precise due process concern is also at play in the Gatecrasher's Paradox and the Prison Riot Problem. Once we've found the 502nd rodeo attendee liable for trespassing, or we've convicted every prisoner in the riot case, there exists a certainty that an innocent person has been found liable or has been found guilty, respectively. Where we have that certainty of factual impossibility, we have a due process violation. But that only gives us really half the answer, right? Because it can't be the case that the first 501 defendants in the Gatecrasher's Paradox merely throw up their hands in frustration and acknowledge, oh, well, we were sued within the realm of the factually possible, whereas the 502nd defendant is lucky, this is factually impossible, so he has this newly acquired due process defense. That can't be the case especially considering the fact that the evidence advanced against those first 501 defendants, remember the 50.1% chance that each of them is indeed a trespasser, is exactly the same evidence that would be presented against the remaining rodeo attendees, whether it's the 502nd or the 999th. So in my project, I argue that due process violations take a second form, and a form that's unique to naked statistical evidence. If the same naked statistical evidence could be used to impose liability on any randomly selected member of a population, and the subsequent imposition of liability on the entire population would constitute a due process violation because of factual impossibility, then imposing liability on even one defendant constitutes a due process violation. And voila! With that, we've solved the Gatecrasher's paradox and the prison riot problem were it only so easy. As Christian's paper rightly notes, and as I acknowledge in my paper, my solution is only applicable in those situations where we can be assured of factual impossibility. It's therefore inapplicable in other cases involving naked statistical evidence that don't give rise to factual impossibility, such as the famous blue bus problem. And here lies the value of Christian's new project. Pushing back against recent papers that have sought to solve these proof paradoxes by reconceptualizing the proof process entirely, Christian offers a robust account for handling each of these problems involving naked statistical evidence. One that calls for looking at these problems through a Benthamite view of justice rather than reconceptualizing the proof process entirely. So we're certainly at an exciting point here, right? In just the last five years or so, we've had a flurry of renewed discussion about the implications of the proof paradoxes. Pieces from Christian now, myself, Ed, Mike Pardo, of course, was on the podcast, Dale Nance, and many others. Expect this conversation to continue apace in the years ahead. Support for Excited Utterance is generously provided by Vanderbilt Law School's Brandstetter Litigation and Dispute Resolution Program the University of Arkansas School of Law, as well as the Vanderbilt Institute for Digital Learning. The producer is Ed Chang. 
and the production editor is Grace DiPietro. Additional production assistance is provided by Francesca Rutherford, and music is provided by the Vanderbilt University Blair School of Music's Children's Cello Choir, under the direction of Kirsten Castle Greer. I'm your host today, Alex Nunn, from the University of Arkansas School of Law, and I do hope that you will join us next time when we take on another work in the world of evidence and proof.